a very wise man once said, there are horrors beyond life's edge that we do not suspect, and once in a while a man's evil prying calls them just within our range. Halloween, my dear friends, is almost upon us, and what better way to celebrate than the fourth and final in my anthology series leading up to the wonderful, wonderful day. Once again, I present you with a fantastic range of stories from the incredibly talented Ryan Brenneman. Five in all for you this evening. One more coming tomorrow as a special Halloween Day treat. Well, my dear friends, have you been good this year? Doesn't really matter, does it? Not for this holiday. Anyway, it is time once again to sit back and relax with your favourite drink and listen. There's a calling among the woods whispered among the whispers of the midnight breeze. A calling, hushed and wary, that beckons to a cabin settled within the snowy mountains, at a lowly place surrounded by a mob of white firs and pines. A dreary shack, with walls of rotten, full of holes. A truck sits idle outside, its engine cold and its cab empty. Headlights flicker, their strength wavering in long, struggling breaths that dance across the west side of the cabin. A snow shovel rests on the porch. A cool crimson creeps down its handle, dripping into the snow. Although the blinds are closed tightly, and both the front and back doors are locked shut, they can't conceal the sounds, the horrors committed within that house. The sharp scraping of a table's feet against a naked wood floor. A deep, throaty moan indistinguishable of pleasure or pain, and a wet sound, almost reminiscent of pigs feeding from within a trough. All of this over the light, cackling sounds of a gentle, healthy fire. These sounds continue for some time. They are ravenous, feasting sounds. As the wind blows through the trees, blowing snowflakes into flight, gifting the dark with their chilling splendour, the noises start to falter. They fade and the snow drifts towards the ground, falling between the dark. It is then, in that silence, that the whispering quickens, hastening to utter a lonely name. They beckon. They call. Dakota Black. The front door flies open, and the man, Dakota Black, stumbled onto the porch, melting the snow beneath his fingertips with a warmth of blood, his and someone else's. It covers his arms and hands, his chest and his face. It encompasses his mouth, smeared like jam. His sin sticks between his teeth, and he leaves the porch like a drunkard, barely managing to grab onto the snow shovel before he does so. He trips over his own shame and fear, landing face first into the fresh snow. He lets the shovel lie, it bites into him like a hundred greedy mouths, but he doesn't care. He shudders, but not from the cold. He is afraid because he is watched. He is afraid because they are here too soon. The whistling he hears is not the wind, but the breathing and wheezing of ancient, frigid nostrils. He needs not see them to know. This isn't how he envisioned their meeting. He isn't happy. Still, he prostrates himself, face down in the snow. He spreads out his arms and legs. He is vulnerable, but he is left unharmed. He rises, as they allow, but only to his knees. In frightful reverence, he keeps himself humble before them, before the Council of the Black Woods. He knows their true names, but he doesn't dare think it. He buries the thought in his mind, buries it deep, beyond the hope of light. There's only one which sees initially, but he knows there is not only one. It exists like a nightmare, unfitting for the physical world. It's faceless, skinless. Its skull, like the head of a deer, sits atop broad shoulders. It doesn't shine in the moonlight. It's grey like winter, hollow. The rest of its form hidden behind a nightmare cloak crafted of skin, human skin. Human faces torn and stitched together like the patches of a quilt. 
From within the heavy cloak, a skeletal hand emerges, gesturing forth, and the terrible whispering said to him, Never. Was he to respond? How? He has not a clue as to whether the creature before him mocked, or whether it was a simple inquiry. His rage has decided for him. Adrenaline seizes his hands, and he pulls clumps of grass from beneath the pool of snow. And he screams. He screams into the night, releasing his pain, his guilt, his fear into the frozen sky. He frees his hands and brings them to his face, feeling it as though he were blind. He rounds his cheeks and pinches his ears. He claws at his nose, and his fingertips glide across his chapped lips. He is unchanged. He is Dakota. That isn't good enough. Why? he asks. Born of the ink in the woods, the council bleed into the night. Dakota beholds them with a horrid, wanting lust. Such a horrid majesty, he thinks, his eyes feasting upon them. What splendid variety. A beast scampers across the ground. It's naked, like a man, but it is so clearly not. Spikes blister the skin, particularly down its spinal column. Its fang jaws hang agape, and not by choice. It is seemingly broken, rendered useless. The torn flesh by the corners of its mouth seem to confirm that theory. Like an ape, it clings low to the earth only stopping every so often to readjust its damaged jaw. It looks young. Another creeps out on stilt-like legs, walking forward on all fours. Pairs of antlers sprout all the way from the base of its human skull, across its sloping shoulders and across its mud-caked backside. Its true face hides behind an emotionless white mask. Dense branches snap like frail kindling, as one behemoth emerges from the woods, snow nearly invisible as it falls across its matted white fur. As tall as a shack, and with a girth as wide as his truck, it stood indomitable above all the rest, red eyes blazing. One hangs from within the trees, clinging to the bark with all four arms. His eyes glitter yellow like fetid stars. Another looks like a wildebeest, or perhaps a buffalo, that learned to stand on two legs. It clambers through the snow on bulky legs, with arms so long they graze the snow. Its eyes, like those of a shark, solid, ebony, and unfeeling. Why so many? he asks. I all wanted to see. Another creeps low, body of tattered, rotting fur. Another stalks a perimeter, only its hooved legs are visible, its torso is covered by the black. And then there's the one that steps out of the cabin, from behind Dakota. He wants to rise, but he knows he can't. He restrains himself even as the thing towers over him. Its face used to be human. They all used to be human. It drops something beside him before returning to the council. Something heavy. Blood splatters. Red constellations across an ivory sky. It's the other man. A large, portly man. Glazed brown eyes. His gut torn asunder, as if ravaged by wild dogs. The young one, the one with the broken jaw, starts whimpering. It's anxious, gaunt and hungry. It slavers red. Dakota no longer pays attention, not to the council. He drools as well. The body, his sin, has been returned to him. Perhaps as another chance. With the council watching, he feeds once more. He shreds, tears, pries without remorse, without care. He does so until his body betrays him, and the pain in his lungs is too great. He feels like he's drowning in dry air. He coughs in a fit, spraying blood. He falls over, hoping this is it. 
He hopes the pain he feels inside is no longer the cancer. He wonders if, now, he'll start to change. But normality is restored. He can breathe again through an aching throat. He hates it. His body feels like dying, but he will not allow it. Through great, heaving breaths, he rises from the ground, daring to stand before them. It's an insolence that riles the council, all of them showing physical signs and sounds of disgust, except for the one in the cloak of faces. What do you want from me? He shouts at them, arms outstretched. It has become too much for the young one, impatient and inexperienced to bear. He lunges forward, ready to devour, but Dakota doesn't hesitate. The shovel is lifted from the snow and the broad, metal head meets the creature in its gut. Dakota angles the hit downwards, delivering the beast to the frozen earth. There, it flails only for a minute before Dakota brings the shovel down again and again. The beast cries for help, but none of the others assist it. They're intrigued. They watch. Time and time again, with furious screams, Dakota brings the metal shovel to the creature's pale flesh. Spikes snap like bone, but Dakota decides it's not enough. The shovel isn't heavy enough to do real damage, so he starts stabbing, slicing with the shovel's thin, sharp edge. It isn't hard to cut into the creature's paper-like flesh, it wails, and the shovel breaks. Dakota doesn't stop. He beats the creature with what's left, clubbing him with the shattered staff. His screaming doesn't die even as he starts stabbing the quickly fading beast with the splintering edges of the handle. He stabs and stabs, long after the creature has stopped moving. Panting, he looks to the others, uncaring for their silence. What more do you want? he asks, his legs feeling weak. What more could you possibly need? You really want this? He feels the terminal pain rising in his chest. The air, the poison. My dad told me the tales, he mutters. He told me, told me what it would cost. Immortality. What cost? Dakota looks at the mangled corpse. He is fed. A great, great cost of a desperate man. The creature in the cloak of faces steps forward, moving lightly across the snow. The others around the perimeter seem to do the opposite. They retreat backwards, just a hair, just a step. The one with the cloak stands not a meter from Dakota's face, and although it has no eyes... Dakota knows it can't look away. It is confused. It is scared. And Dakota doesn't know why. Flesh, he hears it whisper. From somewhere within the cloak is the cost of desperate men. A ticket for a spirit to enter. To turn and mould a degraded body into a weakened soul that has partaken in the unforgivable. To sever an irreparable connection between vessel and spirit. Only when weakened can a soul, can a body, be properly moulded. Dakota takes a step closer, daring to stand face to face. Are you saying I'm not worthy? The creature tilts its head. You are. Dakota swallows his fear. Well, then why? Because you are strong. Dakota can't stop shaking. His fists clench. I need to be one of you, he demands. Make me one of you. One of us, it asks. Say it. The creature rounds him, moving around him clockwise. It whispers. What do you want us to make you? He gasps as he says it as the creature places its skeletal palms upon his shoulders. Wendigo. The night pauses. The wind dies. The moon dims in the sky. The council has faded. 
all except for the one that whispers in his ear. No. The cloak opens wide, and before he can say a word, Dakota is pulled inside, into the black. Captain Leander leaned on the helmsman's chair. Other hand rests comfortably on her hip, eyes gazing out into the darkness of space. When she asked, So, what am I looking at? It sat there utterly still out there, among the void, idling like a perished fish, awkwardly tilted to one side, neutrally buoyant. It was larger than them, older. A derelict, Corbin, the pilot told her. A hissing coursed over the comms. How long have they been broadcasting that distress signal? She asked. Can't be certain, Corbin answered with a shrug, bringing them in close. We've been picking it up for at least twelve hours now. Up close, the ship looked like a corpse. Its outside was blighted and bronzed, an oxidized hull in the void of space. It didn't fit. The broadcast is just a repeated SOS signal, Corbin explained as the captain moved closer to the forward window. I have no idea what it's about. How many life signs are you reading? She asked, resting her arm on the bulkhead. She could read the faint letters that sat across the forsaken ship's port side. The Kraken. Just what? Corbin said, shaking his head. At least it's not a ghost ship. Captain Leander frowned. Might as well be. That looks only barely like an LV-42 freighter. Small, but it'll safely run with a crew of maybe twenty souls. Something is wrong. You're telling me, Corbin said, preparing to circle the quiet ship. Missing, what, nineteen people? That doesn't make me feel terribly good about the one that's left. What are we going to do? She backed away from the bulkhead and placed a hand on Corbin's shoulder. Get the others up. Dock us to that ship. Find the survivor. If, um, survivor's the appropriate term, he corrected. That's why we're waking the rest of the crew, she said with a smirk. Need more eyes. I get to stay here, though, right? Corbin asked, only half-joking. Just do it, Captain Leander ordered. And he did. Within minutes, they were docked on one of the derelict's airlocks. With a sharp, serpentine hiss, the lock opened, and four crew members of the salvage ship Eleanor stepped onto the darkness of the Kraken. The deck was, as expected, empty and dark. Lights in the metal corridors flickered dimly, sputtering, trying to stay lit. The captain ordered. All right. Like we discussed. Tyron, you're with me. We're going to make our way to the bridge. See if we can figure out what happened here. Freya and Rhea, you girls are going to search the decks. The life pods from everywhere. There's one soul left on this boat. Good or bad, we're going to get them off. Understood? Rhea knocked on her own helmet. Yeah, we got it. Can we take these off now? Says the air is clear. Mine's fogging up a storm. I don't care, Captain Leander said. You good, Freya? Freya nodded, holding her rifle tight against her shoulder. Yep, she said, staring down the dark corridors. Doesn't mean I like it, though. Rhea pulled her helmet off and took one awful breath. Gagging, she wasted no time putting the bulgy helmet back on her head. Jeez she said, panting. Damn! What was it? asked the captain. What's wrong? Rhea hunched herself, hands on her knees, audibly praying to not vomit in her helmet. Oh, it stinks, she said in pain breaths. It smells like death in here, like the back of a slaughterhouse. Probably just Tyra, Freya said, playfully. Captain Leander scanned the floor, there was nothing there but rusted grates. Rusted, the captain thought, like the outside of the hull. 
Fuck off, Tyrone said, not playfully. This is serious. Hmm. I don't know what could be causing the smell, Captain Leander said, looking across all of them. But where there's rotting stink, there's usually something doing the rotting. Aye, Freya said, scanning the bulkhead with her flashlight. You know, technically, rust is what happens when metal rots. Rust doesn't smell like flesh, Rhea said nervously, her face still frozen with disgust. The captain pointed down the corridor leading to the Kraken's bridge. Tyrone, she said, taking command, we still have a job to do. Care to take the lead? With pleasure, Captain, the hulking man said, bringing his gun to bear. Captain Leander followed him, walking backwards so she could say to the others, Keep comms open. See anything? Holler. Stay tight. Working on it, Rhea called. Don't get lost. The captain stood shoulder to shoulder with Tyron, her own pistol wrapped firmly under her fingers. The grates groaned beneath their weight. The way to the bridge blew up brightly on their HUDs. Corbin, called Captain Leander. You there? Come in, Corbin. A voice grew in her ear. Got you, Captain. Been following all along. It's like I'm right there with you. But not, Tyrone said bitterly. Thanks for reminding me, Corbin said with an audible smile. Good news, the ship's doing a little bit better now. Reading five life signs, not just one. You guys must be doing something good in there. Very funny, Corbin, the captain said, stone-faced. Can you pinpoint the other life form for us? Still weird, Corbin said, smacking his lips as he worked. I see you four. You guys are heading towards the bridge, and Rhea and Freya are back approaching the main staff quarters, I assume. But nothing. Just four red dots. Nothing else in the entire ship. Probably just a glitch, Tyron mumbled, eyes scanning all around them checking every metal and wire crevasse. Mm, Probably, Corbin said. But good luck anyways. You guys are about twenty yards from the bridge. Wasn't hard to find, the captain said. Pretty straight shot. Focus on Rhea and Freya. They have the hard job. All right, I'll leave you guys alone for a bit then. Peace. They were left in the narrow, silent hallway with only each other and a peeling iron door. How is this ship rusting? The captain asked Tyron. Ships can't rust. I'm not sure, Tyron said, leaning in close to the wall. He scraped it with his finger, brushing pieces of metal onto the floor. The ship's brittle, very brittle. I'm surprised we didn't damage it just by looking at it. There was a short, unstable flight of stairs that brought them to the bridge. The captain let Tyron take the lead, watching with careful eyes the path they'd just taken. There was a whistling in the pipes, like steam. The hall was still empty. Tyron had no issues getting the door to open. Its locks had rusted and were easy to break open. Little black and red and orange pieces crumbled like dirt, scattering in the stagnant air. The door creaked open, and the two made their way inside. Five seconds later, they were entirely confused. Where is everything? Tyron asked. There's nothing here. The bridge was empty. There were no panels, no computers, no pilot's chair or navigation module. There wasn't even a forward hull window, just an empty black room. Corbin, Captain Leander called. You need to check the schematics you found. This can't be. No, Tyrone interrupted, placing a hand on her shoulder, leaning his head in as he whispered. This is the bridge, all right. Make no mistakes, we are here. Then where is everything? She asked in response. You can't drive a ship out this far into space without a damn steering wheel. Perhaps it was stripped, Tyrone suggested. You make no mistake, the captain returned, showing him the perfectly grated floor. There 
was never anything here. If it was stripped, we could still see where panels and stations were plugged in, but we can't. There was never a bridge on this ship. Just then, the voice of Freya came over the comms. Captain, she asked. We made it to the engine rooms, and... She hesitated. No, the captain thought, already making for the door. She knew exactly what they were going to say. I don't know how to say this, Captain, but there's nothing here. The captain was already moving down the stairs, hastily moving towards the engine room. She started to call Tyron, but he was at her side. The engine room has no engine. It's just a shell. Freya, the captain ordered, now running down the corridor. Get back to the airlock, now. Ma'am? Freya asked, confused. Corbin came across too, asking, Captain, what's going on? Just go, Captain Leander barked. Corbin, keep your eyes on the damn radar. She wasn't confused. She knew exactly what this meant. It was a hollow ship. Inoperable, unflyable, dead with a distress beacon playing anyways. She didn't know who or why, but she understood a simple truth. The ship was a trap, and they'd taken the bait. Captain, Tehran said, overtaking her slightly so he could run and meet her eyes. What's happening? Someone set us up, she huffed. I've heard of pirates using scuttle ships before to lure in salvages and rescuers. Easy to catch you when you're boarded to a lifeless hunk. But, Tyron said, confused, you said it yourself. This ship was never capable of flying, period. How did it get here? They must have towed it, the captain mumbled. It doesn't matter. We need... Oh, shit. They'd reached the airlock, but... Freya and Rhea were nowhere to be found. Captain called for them on the comms. Where are you guys? We're at the airlock. Hurry up. There was nothing but a palpable tension. The ear-splitting sound of raised, patient guns. Tyrone took a deep breath. Come in, the captain repeated, holding it together, holding strong, but still nothing came out of the dark hall. There was a faint buzz. Captain! Corbin! the captain asked, hushedly. What's happening? I can't raise them either, Captain, he said apologetically. Do we have incoming? she asked. No, Corbin said quickly. We're still all alone out here. Why do you ask? She couldn't help but feel some partial relief. Because this ship is a trap, Corbin she said, steadily inching forward, and I wasn't sure if it would be sprung from the outside or the inside. Tyrone and the captain worked their way through the ship's failing innards, attempting to hail Rear and Freya the whole time. Damn it, cursed the captain as they entered the engine room. There was nothing there, as they were told. Unfortunately, the persons who had told them were also missing. Captain, Corbin said, returning to the comms. His voice was weak, shaky. The captain didn't like it. Corbin was never nervous without reason. Yes, Corbin, she asked in a whisper. I'm only getting three life signs now. What? she asked, stunned. Check it again. I have, Corbin snapped. I've rechecked and rechecked. I can't find them. They're, they're missing, Captain. I don't... Well, keep looking, Tyrone said, moving back into the hall. Captain Leander didn't follow him right away. She stood, staring at the open, black room with hopeless eyes. It doesn't make any sense, she thought. One person shouldn't have been able to get the drop on Rear and Freya. They couldn't. There was a violent clang that shook the air. Spinning around... The captain moved into the hallway, calling Tyrone's name. When she got there, she found only his gun, resting on the rusty grates. Tyrone, she called into the dark passageways. 
Swooping down, she picked up his rifle on the go and chased an unseen enemy down the hall. There's nothing there, Captain, Corbin said, following her through the halls on his computer. You're the only one I register. You and... and whatever was there before. His words seemed to trail off as Captain Leander, refusing to accept that her crew, her friends, were gone, continued to rush down the hall. Please, Captain, Corbin begged. Please, turn around. We don't know what's in there. But the captain didn't listen. She followed the twisting, narrowing hallways as far as she could. They led her straight to a large, open chamber. A cargo bay of sorts. An empty cargo bay. Wherever had taken Tyron from her, whatever, was strong. Tyron was a huge man. No one could have done it alone. Not like that. It was impossible. Spinning, she shone her flashlight to the corners of each and every wall as she desperately searched for Freya, for Rhea, and for Tyron. Where are you? she called desperately. Then, after a moment of quiet panic, static came over the radio. Static that, after just a moment, erupted into screams in the captain's ear. Captain! Corbin screamed. Get out of there! I found the life form! I found it! It's the... His voice cut off, as the entire ship seemed to groan and strain. Flakes of black, like ash, fell from the rafters above. They landed on the captain's exosuit, and she stared at them. It was uneasy how similar they were to scabs. Then, she understood. She'd been right about the trap, but so wrong about everything else. There was a pressure around her ankle. Oh my God, she thought. The one life form. The ship. A metal, rotten hand gripped the captain's ankle, and in a swift moment the grates parted like jagged teeth. The hand pulled down, and the living ship swallowed her whole. Outside, a creeping, rotting rust slowly spread across the airlock of the Kraken and seeped into the body of the Eleanor. And the distress signal continued to beat. How could Ron sleep with such beautiful snow drifting by outside his window? Besides, it was Christmas Eve, after all. Of course he was tired. The day had been busy. Started by cleaning the house in anticipation of his mother's family and their imminent arrival upon the following morning, followed by a last-minute trip to Kroger with his teenage sister, because his dad had, of course, forgotten to grab the marshmallows for the sweet potatoes. Then it was racing every which way from Walmart to church, and then, finally, Ron's grandparents' house to celebrate with his father's side of the family. They'd gotten back well past ten, much later than Ron was normally allowed to be awake. They'd been looking at Christmas lights on their way home. And so, of course, he was tired. But no child sleeps on Christmas Eve, especially not one who's waiting for Santa Claus. The hours passed away, night turning into early morning, but, but his rooftop was still quiet and bare. Thoughts of presents burned in his head as a giddiness warmed and sparkled in his heart like firecrackers. He'd been so good all year long. Surely the base of the tree would be filled, packed full of gifts and goodies. So many colours, so many sizes of bows and ribbons, for him and his sister, for his mama and his dad. But there was a change in the winds that Ron could feel while tucked in his bed. He sat up with a fright as the night started to howl and turn. The snow outside whipped past his window, scattering as it fell. As the house seemed to tremble, there was a clattering upon the roof. It was an unmistakable sound, on this night most of all. The sound, the clacking of a great many reindeer hooves. <gasps> Ron couldn't believe it. First there was joy, overwhelming joy. Santa had come. He was here, here. He'd come to bring his presents as he slept. But he wasn't asleep. Didn't he need to be asleep? He thought so. Startled and embarrassed, he instantly fell straight back to bed, pulling the covers tight overhead. 
Would Santa know he wasn't asleep? Ron figured as much. So he pulled the sheets tight, tied over his face, listening in the darkness as Santa dismounted his sleigh. Those weren't the sounds that Ron had imagined Boots to make. They were footsteps, surely, as the house moaned beneath a shifting weight. But with each step, there was an awful scraping, a horrid cluck, cluck, cluck. They were angry footsteps, at least that's what Ron thought. Why would Santa be mad? Why else, he pondered, I'm still not asleep. So he closed his eyes and lay so perfectly still. Maybe, just maybe, Santa wouldn't be mad. And there he listened. As the awful, clacking sounds moved from the ceiling and down their wall. Not down the wall, down the chimney, Ron realized. It spread into the house, and Ron started to shiver. The December night seemed to creep into his room even though the window held tight. Letting the covers fall over him completely, he shrunk inwards, clutching his knees close to his chest, his hands rubbing and warming his feet. There was a jingling sound, along with the clack-clacks, that came from downstairs. Santa was at the tree, surely. He was dropping presents and candy. He was filling the stockings nailed to the mantle above the holly with all kinds of goodies and more. There was... For a moment, a clattering, sharp and unwelcome, but Ron just shrugged it off. Santa must have dropped the plate of warm chocolate chip cookies. Then, Ron started to wonder. The clacks were moving through the house, away from the living room and away from the tree. Where was Santa moving, and in such a slow, sluggish way? The awful footsteps meandered through the house, through every room and hall, until they came to the bottom of the stairs. Santa was coming up the stairs, but for the first time, Ron really wasn't sure. Why would Santa be coming upstairs? He'd often dreamed of meeting Mr. Claus, but he had a terrible feeling. He didn't want to meet Santa. Not tonight, and not just because he'd been naughty and stayed awake. The closer the footsteps got, the more his teeth chattered. Christmas Eve had always been like a wondrous dream before. Tonight, somehow, it felt more like a nightmare. At the top of the stairs, Santa turned down the hall, towards Ron's parents' room. The door there creaked open. But why? Why would Santa need to see his parents? What was he doing? The footsteps stopped for a while, and Ron listened closely. He wondered if he'd woken them. If Santa and his parents were talking, perhaps talking about him. But soon the scratching footsteps started again, moving towards Ron, moving down the hall. He listened, as Santa stopped outside his sister's room, just a room down the hall. He was close. And the more he heard the clacking clacks, the more Ron imagined a big, mangy raven or crow than a big man in red. Ron had grown nervous. Santa was in his sister's room for a very long time. Then, at last, it was his turn indeed. As Santa crept down the hall and pried open Ron's door. With a hiss, he entered. The only warmth Ron could feel surprised him. He hadn't expected the tears that moistened his cheeks. The footsteps, clack, 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 stopped right beside his bed, and the sounds were replaced with a laboured, heavy breathing. Ron didn't know what to expect, for he no longer believed that this was Santa Claus. Whatever stood before him didn't feel warm and cheery. Whatever stood before him made the air tremble and shake. How could it not be Santa? Ron wondered. Only Santa can drive in Santa's sleigh. It must be him. It must. Mustn't it? He couldn't see the thing that should have been Santa, but he imagined it standing, leaning over him, scowling and sneering. He could feel it, an anger unimaginable. 
he wanted to cry. But the thing, Santa, left without a word, without an assault of any kind. It clacked down the stairs, through the living room where it momentarily paused, and then it hastened its escape, fleeing up the chimney and out onto the roof. Hooves above stomped and clattered, almost in protest, as the thing that should have been Santa mounted the sleigh. Rotten, feeling warm once more, threw off the covers and got up at once. The thing. What could it have been? Not Santa. Surely not. But it had left something under the tree. He knew that for sure. And so, without waking his parents, as fast as he could... Ron moved down the dark hall and down the stairs towards the living room and their great, luminous Christmas tree. The lights were on, but not the ones they'd placed. The charcoal tree glimmered with tiny red dots, blistering like embers, but that wasn't all. In the fireplace, a real fire still burned. No, raged. Uncontrolled, its large tongues licked about the carpet and dangling holly, scorching them black. But more. The stockings were gone. Stolen. Replaced. Ron's face contorted with pain and horror. Nailed to the mantle. Three familiar faces. Stolen from their rooms in the middle of the night. Their screams were silent. Ron's was anything but. Satisfied, the thing that stole Santa's sleigh smiled and mushed the unwilling reindeer on. There were still so many houses left to visit that night. Ms. Moore was a peculiar old hag, and the whole town of Lincoln, New Hampshire, knew so. Every day, at about a quarter to four, Ms. Moore would walk the streets. She did so every day, whether sleet or hail, whether sun or rain, and she always wore the same garish thing. A black, wrinkly dress that dropped down low over her greying white socks, and a wide-brimmed hat to match, with a veil that cast down across her face. A widow through and through, at least for the past seventeen years. And at the end of her arms, a pair of white gloves that reached to her elbow, and within her grasp, each and every time, the handle of a death-black stroller with a large overhanging cover on top. That was, as she told anyone who asked, where she kept Mr. Muffins on their walks. Now, no one had ever seen Mr. Muffins, and, according to many, neither had Ms. Moore. If one were to ask, well, what kind of dog is he? Then Ms. Moore could be inclined to respond, why, he's a shy little terrier he is. Or she could say, oh, Mr. Muffins is just a timid little pom pom. Or still, some have heard, Mr. Muffins is, well, he's actually just a little stray kitty who likes to keep me company. And they have to ask because, as everyone who has ever tried harshly finds out, you can't ever look at Mr. Muffins. Adults and kids alike have all tried and tried, but Ms. Moore is adamant and fierce, frighteningly so especially for her age. Many have gotten close, tried to peek inside, tried to lift the blankets inside, but to do so always incurred Ms. Moore's vicious wrath. Never afraid to swat a hand or slap a face, Ms. Moore was a force to be reckoned with. For whatever reason, she was sure as hellfire never going to let any man, woman or child ever look at and disturb her precious Mr. Muffin. It, of course, left many to speculate and gossip about what exactly Mr. Muffins really was. There were some, mostly those older and friendlier to the eccentric old lady, who just had to take her word that there was nothing inside that stroller but some kind of pet that she loved most dearly. They would often be fast to claim that, oh, if you ever pass her on the street and listen close, there is something certainly breathing and moving in there. However... Most others would agree that whatever Ms. Moore carried around with her every single day was something else entirely. Some would claim that she was, well, partially right. They liked the notion that perhaps Mr. Muffin was a pet at one point. 
The idea of Mesmore carrying around a cart full of bones carried a certain loony charm. Others further believed that maybe it was something truly strange, like a pet gator or a snake. Something that she'd, understandably, want to keep a bit more concealed. And it would explain the noises. To ask the most eccentric, however, would be to invite lunacy. For many still claimed that the reason for her mournful attire was that, inside that cradle, she carried the remains of her dear departed husband. They would tell you that Mr. Muffins was her pet name for the man, and that she took him out every single day at the time he died. Crazy theories, but that was all anyone could do. No one was close to the woman. No one knew the truth about what Mr. Muffins was. No one. However, however, there was one person who can claim what no one else can. There was a man who had seen inside the carriage. Everett Flores had seen Mr. Muffins. It had been a chill afternoon, sometime in October, when Everett and his friend, a boy named Douglas Snow, hatched a plan to see inside the old bat stroller. It was a plan that worked to perfection. As she passed by on their street that fateful afternoon, Everett hid behind a row of bushes that Ms. Moore would have to pass. At the moment she was getting ready to, from the other side of the street, young Douglas Snow purposefully missed a shot on his basketball hoop. The ball went wild, straight across the street, and hit Ms. Moore right on the head, causing her to stumble and release the cart. Douglas ran across the street, feigning sincerity in his rambling apologies. As the old woman massaged her head and tried to regain her wits, Everett Flores crept forward. On his knees, he peered into the stroller, as Douglas Snow reached Ms. Moore's side, trying intently to distract her. She didn't care for his apologies, telling the young Mr. Snow to scram and leave me alone. She would have continued to berate him too, had she not noticed Everett still leaning over inside of the carriage, and to this she had a reaction that Douglas had not expected. He had anticipated hellfire, vengeful fury, and hateful curses. Instead, all Ms. Moore could do was raise her hands to her mouth and wail. Her screeches were sharp, cutting and painful. Douglas took the chance, as Ms. Moore brought her hands to her face, covering her mouth, to go over and grab Everett Flores by the shoulders. Yanking him hard, he dragged Everett away, unable to get him to, f unable to get him fully up on his feet. He knew that something was wrong right then and there. Everett said not a word. As they crossed the street, Douglas heard the old woman lament aloud. I'm so sorry, Mr. Muffins. I'm so sorry. Please forgive me. Please. Douglas reached the curb and tripped over Everett, causing them both to fall hard onto the ground. Douglas landed on top of Everett, and Everett's face hit the concrete sidewalk hard. Douglas said that she turned to him, in that moment before she turned the corner of the block to flee, and she shouted, He'll get a taste for it. He'll get a taste. Douglas had no idea what she meant by that, but when he looked down to Everett to see what was wrong, he didn't know what to say. Everett's eyes were red, and full to the brim with blood. Doctors told Everett and his family he'd pop blood vessels in his eyes and that... With time, he'd heal. They said they weren't sure if it was from the fall or something before. The fall had given Everett a concussion and a few scrapes and bruises, but other than that, he seemed completely fine. On the outside, at least. According to Douglas, Everett didn't say much after that. In fact, he never spoke a word about Ms. Moore or Mr. Muffin ever again. He had another ailment that the doctors explained away. Temporal amnesia caused by the concussion. Douglas never bought it, not even for a moment. He always attested, and surely still does to this day, that, that what happened to Everett wasn't caused by the concussion. In the next few years, before Everett moved halfway across the country for college, Douglas said he never once told him what he saw. He'd always told Douglas, I don't know, I don't remember anything. But Douglas could always see it, he would say. 
He could always see it in Everett's eyes. A deep regret. A deep fear. Unmistakable. Unforgettable. Their friendship fell apart as the years stretched on, to the point where Douglas had lost track of Everett entirely. Strangely enough, it seemed the rest of the world lost track of him as well. Everett Flores went missing five years ago, vanished from his home in Arlington, Washington, five years after his incident with Ms. Moore and Mr. Muffins. To everyone but Douglas, the two incidents were completely unrelated, and Everett Flores was never found. Still, Ms. Moore continues to roam the town every day, at a quarter till four, with Mr. Muffins tucked safely in his stroller. And still, she insists quite harshly, that you don't peek. Don't you dare, she'll say, with a weak old smirk. If you do, you might just get a taste for it. Whatever it might be. It's a bad crop this year. I planted the fields around my house the day after the last frost. Risky, but I couldn't wait. If July got here and I had nothing to show for it, then there'd be hell to pay. I was out there at first light, and wasn't back in until well after sunset. I had to be sure it was right. Made sure I took down all those damn scarecrow posts, too. Burned them that night. I knew the ground was still unyielding and cruel, but the seeds could take it. I wasn't planting simple corn or beans, after all. Yet... I admit I was worried that they wouldn't take for the first couple of weeks. I was impatient. My anxiousness led me to slaughter my cows and horses, mince them and ground them, spread them across the field in a pulp. The ground absorbed them, and the seeds feasted. I'd like to think that it was necessary. Well, they sprouted the very next day. That red from my animal's blood pulsed within those seedlings, as they sprouted like little red worms. I was pleased, but from then on, I knew it would be tricky. They would need to be fed. Fortunately, crows and mice were plentiful, and dim enough to find themselves caught. I'd often hear the cries of the crows, especially when I was working outside. I didn't much care to watch. Those awful screams brought back far too many memories. It only took weeks for them to reach several feet high. They grew as thick as corn and seemed prepared to reach the same height. Their stalks were moist and warm. Their leaves were slender and wiry with wispy tendrils that coiled like snakes. They were meaner than any creature I'd ever seen. And I've seen some mean pieces of work. They were easily able to take down raccoons and possums, snaring them in their leaves and tearing them apart with impossible strength. Their tendrils were like garrot wire around the necks of their victims. I never saw any of the bodies. I think they dragged them down into the earth and finished their business there. I'd do my damnedest to make sure I stay away. they got a good five-foot reach on them now, and I've heard them take down deer. I had to move the chicken coop closer to the house, and the family knows good and well to avoid the fields. It's a danger to even leave my driveway now, on foot or by car. Not that we have anywhere or any need to go. That's good. The end of June now. The plants are holding strong. None have wilted. None have faltered. It's a bad crop this year. That's a good thing. I can sleep at night. So can my wife. And so can the three children I still got left. It's been a year since the last one was taken. Out the window at night. We'll see if they try it again this year. I kind of hope they do. I'd like to see any one of those damn scarecrows get through my field of red wheat. So, five stories for you there this evening. Did you enjoy them? I did. Um, Definitely one of my favourite writers. Um, Not writing too much at the moment, but fortunately there's so many stories in the back catalogue for me to work through that 
I still have plenty to spare. Well, um, another coming for Halloween tomorrow. Of course there is. It's Halloween. How could I not release a special Thursday video on Halloween? <laughs> so, don't, you know, I don't normally do them on Thursdays, but I am this week. You ready for it? Of course you are. Well, hopefully I'll see you again tomorrow night. If not, I will be back again on Friday, just like always. Until tomorrow, though, sweet dreams and bye-bye. Thank you so much for choosing to spend your time listening to me. Now, if you enjoyed the Dr. Creepin experience, then come find me on Facebook. Come chat with me on Twitter. Listen to the background music and download it if you like on SoundCloud. Drop by the store, pick up a t-shirt. And, importantly, if you've got a story you'd like me to read, send it to Dr. Creepin's Vault, the subreddit I set up so that I could read your stories. Now, Looking forward to seeing you all again real soon, so come check me out, okay?